All right, I could read uh, Barbara's thing. Um, <clears throat> But you all have it in your, in, your, uh, in your program. I just want to highlight a couple of things. She is the uh, Joe R. Engel Professor of Preaching at Union Theological Seminary, an ordained minister in the ELCA. She's been president of the Academy of Homiletics, and her writing and teaching and preaching has shaped a generation of preachers, including me. We were talking last night at dinner, and Barbara was asked, who is the person that shaped you? as a preacher, and I found myself asking that question of, my, of myself, and it's Barbara. So it is my honor to introduce you to Barbara Lundblad. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And uh, I even got, David, I got a hat. <laughs> so wherever I go now, I will have to explain what WP means. But um, it's, it's wonderful to be at this place where a working preacher is helping literally millions of people. And uh, I... It's a site that I go to uh, regularly, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I must say that before yesterday, the last time I preached at Luther Seminary was in January of 1990. Now, it's not that I have such a good memory, but I do have sermon files. So I look through these sermon files to say, well, I don't want to preach on the same text this time. <laughs> so, you know... Not that I'm saying who would remember uh, 22 years ago, but um, I remember it well because my plane was terribly delayed and I, uh, the pilot didn't show up. And I, uh, I got here to the seminary. It, well, this wasn't built yet, right? I, I can't remember. I, my, I'm blank except that the procession was just going up the aisle when I got here from the airport. And the text that I preached on that day was one I hardly ever preach on, Matthew's genealogy in chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. <sighs> there are these four rather strange women in that genealogy. I mean, it's strange that there are any women in the genealogy at all, but that there are these four particular women, Tamar, who dressed up as a prostitute in order to seduce her father-in-law to give her the child that she had been promised. Rahab, who was a prostitute, who lived in the walls of Jericho. Ruth, the Moabite woman who made this wondrous promise to her Israelite mother-in-law. And the wife of Uriah. Now we might wish that Bathsheba's name had been remembered, but because she's called the wife of Uriah, it's a constant reminder that Uriah the Hittite was indeed more righteous than the king of Israel. We seldom, this isn't in the lectionary, this text. Maybe it's in the narrative lectionary. Uh, but we can learn a lot from the parts of scripture that we skip. And particularly we can learn some things about particular bodies that we sometimes don't see. These four women have very particular bodies. They are either foreigners or sexually suspect or both. And there they are in Jesus' family tree. We can learn a lot from the bodies that we don't see. And so I have been wondering uh, is there any body in our preaching? No matter if we use the Revised Common Lectionary, the Narrative Lectionary, or no lectionary at all, is there any body in our preaching? And so I want to explore that with you this morning. One of the most radical, shocking verses in all of Scripture comes at the beginning of the Gospel of John. It's not the first verse. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the philosophers all nodded at this first part. Nothing was made without the Word. And then in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. It was that word that was so shocking that this eternal cosmic logos could become flesh. Touch your face. This is flesh I'm talking about, said Baby Suggs in Toni Morrison's novel. This is flesh. Flesh that weeps, laughs. Flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it. Love it hard. She's talking about dark slave flesh that had been beaten, broken, scarred so badly that there were like marks of a tree trunk on the back of a man. This is flesh I'm talking about here, she said. Flesh that needs to be loved. Feet that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support. Shoulders that need arms. Strong arms, I'm telling you. And the word became flesh and lived among us, also beaten, scarred, and broken. This gospel of John, which can sometimes seem so spiritual, dividing everything into in and out, this world and not of this world, dark and light, stakes its life on incarnation. The Word became flesh and lived among us. Not a shadow of the world beyond, but flesh, body. Well, this was too much. And it didn't take long for people to begin to think, well, it wasn't really flesh. <laughs> it wasn't, I mean, what Paul said, writing earlier than John, now you are the body of Christ and members one another of it. Surely there wasn't any flesh on that body. You know that sometimes these metaphors in Scripture, we let them float way up uh, uh, to the ceiling and beyond, and they don't have any flesh left on them. Ethicist Margaret Farley is one of many who remind us of the long tradition now in Christian history of separating body from spirit, soul from flesh. In her book, just love, she writes these words. In this binary division, the soul is frequently the truly human, while the body constitutes an unfortunate and temporary limitation on the human spirit, signified by metaphors like container and contained, prison and imprisoned. Thankfully, John did not say, and the word became a container. If we assume that these, deb that these debates about body and spirit are relegated to the past, some of you may know that this very book, Margaret Farley's book, Just Love, was recently censored by the Vatican. Not to be read in Catholic institutions because it fails to adequately teach Roman Catholic doctrine, especially teachings about the body. Many of the battles within Christian churches have been and continue to be about bodies. Dark slave bodies relegated to the balcony while their white masters worshipped on the main floor until Richard Allen said enough of this and walked out. Menstruating bodies not permitted to receive communion. Women's bodies not allowed to preside at the table for centuries, including major portions of the Christian churches today. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender bodies barred from ordination and from marriage. Disabled bodies, too much trouble to welcome into the sanctuary and into our preaching. Homeless bodies, welcome to come to the soup kitchen 
but seldom sitting beside us on Sunday morning. How can we invite bodies back to church and into our preaching? Elizabeth Bettenhausen, one of our finest theologians who we haven't heard from in many years for reasons both political and physical, she asked these questions some years ago. Do you think with your mind and act with your body? Have faith with your spirit and leave everything else to your body? Is the resurrection of the body in the Apostles' Creed a claim about physical power? Or is the resurrected body a purely physical, spiritual body? Then she says, I have a blind ordained friend who is theologically certain that she will be blind in heaven because she herself will be there, not some other self she does not know. What happens when everybody is invited back to church? When the veteran in the wheelchair reads the gospel? When the visibly pregnant pastor says the body of Christ given for you? When the gay couple bring their adopted son to be baptized? When the blind woman and her dog process with the choir? When the deaf man signs hymns that dance in space? When the body of Christ gathered in the sanctuary is as racially diverse as the New York City subway at rush hour? Over the past 50 years, we've had all sorts of different forms of preaching introduced to us. We've gone from propositional to inductive. Lucy Rose has invited us to see preaching as a conversation. Uh, we've learned the Lowry loop that goes from oops to aha to we. And no matter what form we're using in our preaching, we always need to ask, is there any body? Is there any body there? So simply, I want to look at three particular bodies that I think are left out. Sexual bodies belong in the church. But sexual bodies are a problem, which is a big problem because all of us are sexual bodies. My uh, colleague uh, teaches Old Testament, David Carr, in his book, The Erotic Word, uh, says something that I really hadn't realized before in that book in that book. Though there are certainly exceptions, most of Christianity has been more hostile toward sex than is almost any other world religion. Judaism celebrates marital love and sex between spouses. Some Jewish laws stipulate that a Jewish man must be willing to have sex with his wife on Sabbath Eve, even if he refrains on other days of the week. In contrast, Early Christian writers forbade even marital sex across huge parts of the church year, including church seasons, holidays, and fast days. You can be thankful that we are still in the season of ordinary time. <laughs> When I was growing up at Zion Lutheran in Gowrie, Iowa, which is a wonderful congregation, we, uh, when I was in high school, we got the red book, which is not to be confused with the new book, which looks red, but is called Cranberry. <laughs> but in, uh, you didn't know that, Bishop Curry, yeah. It's a little more like your shirt, but sort of between the red and the cranberry is our new book. But in the old book, Every Sunday, the pastor would say the words of confession on our behalf. We confess to you that we are sinful and unclean. Was I the only teenager sitting there who thought unclean had something to do with sex? Or consider Luther's words about baptism in the small catechism. Baptism signifies that the old Adam in us is to be drowned and destroyed by daily sorrow and repentance together with all sins and evil lusts. What do you think of when you hear that word evil lusts? Maybe you're thinking of greedy landlords. 
or the unquenchable lust for power. But you would be in the minority. <laughs> Years ago, uh, I was on a committee in the, EL, in, in the LCA that was charged with responsibility for worship materials. This was at the time that the Inclusive Language Lectionary was first published. And if you remember those years, if you remember that book, which I think nobody really uses anymore, it caused quite a stir. I mean, there were even death threats against people who were on that translation committee. And we were gathered in a meeting in Philadelphia. My memory is that someone pulled the shades, but I, I think I have added that part. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we were meeting with a very high, highly placed official of the church whose highly placed status I will not name but a very important person was meeting with us no press allowed the issue was whether we would continue to be part of this project or whether we should just cut off all connection to the inclusive language lectionary and the issue for this highly paid placed official was this it was the option in that lectionary of saying God our father and in brackets and mother so that we might read God our father and mother and he said to us if we call God mother we make God a sexual being you know at times like that you you don't know what to say uh, um, I mean, I, I knew that he indeed had children. <laughs> but there is almost a sense that father is a kind of neutral word somehow, a non-sexual word. I mean, you, you can't really tell an expectant father. <laughs> and so there is, I mean, do women's bodies belong in the church. I want to look ahead in the lectionary here to Advent, the end of the Advent season, when this year we have the wonderful story of the visitation between Elizabeth and Mary. This is when Mary runs off uh, to the hill country to see her elderly cousin Elizabeth, who has been, she's been told is actually pregnant. And as soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, she began to say the rosary. Right? Oh, really? <laughs> blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. You didn't know she knew the rosary. I know. I know. Well, the thing is, what, what sign did, did Elizabeth have for this bold proclamation. She is the only person in the first chapter of Luke who has not been visited by an angel. She claimed a different revelation. As soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child leaped in my womb. Now you could either say this is a very precocious prophet, or you could at least ask the question, how could she trust the stirring in her womb? Now we know it also says in the text that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. But you see what we often do? We separate the spirit from her body. So we, we don't want to say that anything important was really going on in her womb, which we might also say in her uterus, which evidently is a word that can't really be said in public much anymore. But something was happening, as, as Sharon Ringy, who is a New Testament scholar, said, Elizabeth's body was teaching her theological truths. Surely she would never have been allowed at the congressional hearings on contraception. <laughs> the interesting thing, among other interesting things about that panel, was that all of the men sitting at that table they were not only that it was all male, 
people asked to testify. They were all from religious communities that do not ordain women. So I don't think Elizabeth would have been there. But trusting the stirring in her womb, she greeted Mary as mother of my Lord. It was the first confession of faith in the Gospel of Luke. And only then did Mary begin to sing, My soul magnifies the Lord. My sermon uh, yesterday did address issues related to gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender bodies. I think we do need to continue to do more work within our church and not only preach about those troubling texts, uh, but to show the humanity of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. I remember so well a workshop that I was at a number of years ago. It was at Union, and it was on sexuality in the black church. And uh, Jim Forbes was part of the panel, and there was a young African-American man who came during the question sessions, and he said, I'm gay, and my church doesn't want me around. So Jim said to that young man, do you have a Bible? And he did. And he said, I, I want you to turn to Psalm 139. And he did. And Jim said, I'd like you to, to just start reading. And he, he did. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. He kept reading. He kept reading. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Jim signaled him to keep going. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. For darkness is as light to you. Keep reading, he said. It was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then he couldn't go on. I think there are ways to preach, to honor the stories of those we think are sexually other, without beating people over the head, and without only preaching on the texts that are so troubling, so that we can bring women's bodies and the bodies of those we see as sexually other into our preaching. Disabled bodies belong in the church. And I know we say we surely want people with disabilities to be in our congregations. We build ramps and elevators. We may have someone doing sign. We may have printed large print bulletins. But still, our language can exclude and our texts can demean. People with disabilities hear biblical texts that leave them out unless they are physically cured. Every deaf person hears, every blind person sees, every mute person speaks, every lame person leaps like a deer. Go in peace. Your faith has made you well. Nancy Mares is a wonderful writer who has lived for many, many years with MS. She has a wonderful book called Waist High in the World, in which she talks about what it's like to see people at their waistline sitting in her wheelchair. She reminds us that our language can demean even without our thinking about it. And I know this, I have done this myself. Because our, our metaphors equate physical disability with moral failure. She gives some examples. Here's what I mean, she says. Sit on your ass, laziness. Take it lying down, weakness. Listen with half an ear, inattention, and get left without a leg to stand on, unsound argument. 
the fact that the soundness of the body so often serves as a metaphor for its moral health, its deterioration thus implying moral degeneracy puts me and my kind in a kind of quandary. How can I possibly be good, she asks. Let's face it, wicked witches are just not ugly as sin. They're also bent and misshapen, crooked. I am bent and misshapen, therefore ugly, therefore wicked, and I have no way to atone. She's talking to me, for I can tell you that I have prayed, forgive me, O oh God, for being deaf to the cries of the poor, for being blind to the needs of my neighbors. And although I pray that way to, to open myself and a congregation to those that we may fail to notice, what I have done there is equating deafness and blindness with moral failure. What do we do when the texts cure disabilities, but people with disabilities are sitting in our pews? Or they're not there because they've never really been welcomed, including thousands now, thousands of veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. We need to have texts from people with disabilities to be in conversation with the biblical text. We need to find partners who can teach us. And there are 43 million Americans, one in six, who live with a disability. So we should be able to find somebody to talk to. Another Nancy has been my teacher. She is Nancy Eastland. She died too soon. She taught for many, many years at Emory University belonged to a Lutheran church in Atlanta. She lived most of her life with a disability that meant at times she could not walk at all. She was just in bed. She had had innumerable surgeries by the time she was 10. She wrote a book called The Disabled God. And she writes this. We might think of this today as we share the Eucharist. She says, who is the one we remember in the Eucharist? This is the disabled God who is present at the Eucharist table. God who was physically tortured, arose from the dead, and is present in heaven and on earth, disabled and whole. Christ's resurrection offers hope that our non-conventional and sometimes difficult bodies participate fully in the Imago Dei. God is changed by the experience of being a disabled body. I first met Nancy Eastland some years ago when she and I led a workshop. The title of it was Texts of Terror, Preaching the Healing Stories of the Bible. That was her name for the text, Texts of Terror. She was borrowing from Phyllis Tribble. But she said, for her, often the healing texts are the most difficult to hear. And she pushed us, including me, to put the person with the disability in the speaking center, which is not always easy because sometimes the person with the disability in the text doesn't speak at all. So we have to listen to other texts to bring them into our preaching. In that workshop, there was a man named Bill who had very serious cerebral palsy. I could hardly understand him when he spoke. His hand, he had one hand that could move the lever, the little uh, lever on his motorized uh, wheelchair. But other than that, people fed him at meals and he was very, he loved to speak. And luckily a friend of mine was the director of the center there and she could translate what he was saying. And finally, you know, by the end of the third day, I was beginning to understand, too. Well, uh, one, the last night, uh, people were uh, in small groups, and they were supposed to reimagine some of these texts. And Bill was in a group. His group decided to have a skit. And uh, he, 
it, it worked like this. Uh, he, he wheeled uh, himself in front of the group, and he, he was ready to go out this door. And uh, the, the other people in the group, they had all planned this out, and they said, Bill, you can't go out. There are steps. And then they kept shouting, don't go out, don't go out, don't go out. Well, this was all planned, of course. And then all of us started chanting, too, don't go out, don't go out. And he opened the door with some help from the others in the group, and he wheeled out there, and we were all still shouting, don't go out, don't go out. And then he, he got us to follow. We all followed him out there onto this kind of big patio area outside this building. And then he turned to us and said, behold the ramp. <laughs> the ramp of God. <laughs> and this is all, he laughed, we laughed. I mean, it was a wondrous moment. <laughs> and the next day, we shared communion as the last thing that we did together as a group. We were all in a circle. And I was presiding, and I had uh, started the... We were passing the elements and saying the words to one another, and I had started to my right. And as I looked, I realized that Bill was, was the person who would serve me. And I thought, I should have planned it the other way, you know, so I could have served him. Uh, so I wondered what would happen. But when it got to Bill, luckily his, uh, the person next to him held the loaf of bread by his hand that he was able to break off a piece of that bread. And he said, Barbara, the body of Christ given for you. And I understood every word. Then in words, of course, that weren't in the liturgy, he said, I never did that before. There are lots of people who can teach us. On Reformation Sunday, if you can tear yourself away from John, And look at that story of Bartimaeus at the end of Mark 10. This is a story where a person with a disability does speak. In fact, he shouts, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then, you know, at the end of that story, predictably, we know how it's going to end. He receives his sight. But what if we could... Imagine a different ending and be clear with people. You're imagining this. You can do that in a sermon. You can say this isn't in the Bible. But what if we could imagine a different ending? Jesus said to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus says, I, I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple. And then he says, I know I shouted at you because I wanted to get your attention. But you don't have to shout at me. I'm blind, but I can hear. And please don't, don't walk away from me in the middle of a conversation be, just because I can't see you go. All I need to do is rest my hand on your arm and I'll know exactly where to go. I will follow you wherever you take me. And the two of them, Jesus and Bartimaeus, went on to the Mount of Olives. Bodies, disabled bodies, belong in our preaching and in the church. And bodies of color belong in church, even in pale congregations. By now, most of us have heard the news, minorities no longer are. They're no longer minorities. As of the last census data, it was in the Times, um, probably your paper too, this was in May 17th of this year. According to the Census Bureau, minorities, including Hispanics, blacks, Asians, and those of mixed race, reached 50.4% representing a majority for the first time in the country's history. Such a turn has been long expected, but no one was certain when the moment would arrive, signaling a milestone nation whose government was founded by white Europeans 
and has wrestled mightily with issues of race from the days of slavery through the Civil War, bitter civil rights battles, and most recently highly charged debates over efforts to restrict immigration. And we might add now, in recent days, attempts to restrict voting. Four years ago, millions of people stood in the cold or watched on television as we inaugurated Barack Obama as the first African-American president. And we were proud of ourselves. Look what we've done. But you know, it didn't take long. Because the body of a black man in the White House <laughs> was too much. It was as much as that shift that the philosophers heard when they heard that the word became flesh. And our idea about racial equality took on a little too much flesh. And it didn't take long for people to begin to say, he wasn't born here. Somebody who looks like that and has a name like that shouldn't be in the White House. And to make matters worse or better, depending on where you stand, a Latino woman was appointed to the Supreme Court. What about white people like me? That's what we heard all through those town hall meetings. I saw people like me, I mean, I saw a woman about my age go to the microphone, sobbing, sobbing. And she said, what has happened to my America? Yeah, did you hear this? I mean, it wasn't just once. She was really saying, what's left for white people like me? And we hear it a lot. The country is being taken over by people who are not like me. And we'll look around here. It's a good thing you're here. <laughs> Really, <laughs> thank you for coming. Really. <laughs> I think sometimes we we don't know what to do with this in congregations because we think, well, our congregation uh, is all uh, white people, and they won't know why we're talking about race, because it's not an issue in Gallery, Iowa, say. It's an issue everywhere. If we live in this, it's, if we live in this world, which we do, bodies, bodies that look different from ourselves are part of our world. They are part of the image of God. And it's very important for us. I thought of this yesterday during... Bishop Curry's wonderful engagement with the bomb in Gilead, this notion of the slave people answering Jeremiah's question, is there no bomb in Gilead? That note reverberating through time. And how often do we in all white congregations preach on those wonderful spirituals? We could. We again, just like just like stories that aren't in the text, we need to bring other stories from other cultures that may not be in our text. And we can do this. There are so many wonderful writings that we can bring in as conversation partners into our sermons. Think ahead, not too far ahead, but just to this next Sunday. Who are those children on Jesus' lap? Can you, can you see them? What race are they? Do they get food stamps? Do they get the children's health insurance program? Do they get to go to the doctor? Who, who are those children? Howard Thurman 
is a wonderful, wonderful guide if we want to hear the voices that may be beyond the voices in our congregation. And you brought us his voice yesterday in talking about the spiritual and his wonderful book, Jesus and the Disinherited. He has another wonderful book that's his autobiography with, with head and heart. And in that book, he tells a story that has become so meaningful for me. He said that he took his children to Daytona Beach where he had grown up. And he says they sauntered down the path of the procession to the Halifax River where they had done baptisms when he was a child. And he says as we were going down this road, we passed the playground of one of the white public schools. As soon as Olive and Anne saw the swings, they jumped for joy. Look, Daddy, they said. Swings. Let's go over and swing. This was the inescapable moment of truth that every black parent in America must face soon or late. What do you say to your child at the critical moment of primary encounter? You can't swing on those swings. Why, Daddy? When we get home and have had some lemonade, I will tell you. When we'd had our lemonade, Anne pressed me for the answer. We're home now, Daddy. Tell us. I said, it is against the law for us to use those swings, even though it is a public school. Only white children can play there, but it takes the state legislature, the courts, the sheriffs and policemen, the white churches, the mayors, the banks and businesses, and the majority of white people in the state of Florida. It takes all of these to keep two little black girls from swinging in those swings. That is how important you are. <laughs> never forget, he said, never forget the estimate of your own importance and self-worth can be judged by how much power people are willing to use to keep you in the place they have assigned to you. You are too very important, little girl. And at that, Olive and Anne knew that they could climb up into the lap of Jesus. For Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, not with any of your powers of legislation or courts or prejudice. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. And he took Olive and Anne in his arms and bless them. I started with the Gospel of John, and you know the Gospel of John ends twice. It ends at the end of chapter 20. Close the book. All these things have been written that you may know that Jesus is the Messiah. And then 21 starts all over again. <laughs> Jesus is at the shore, and the disciples come in, and he invites them to have breakfast. Jesus seems always to be concerned about bodies, feeding them, touching them, welcoming them. And after breakfast, he says to Peter, follow me, which was ridiculous because Peter supposedly had been called to follow a long time ago. But he called Peter as though it was the first time. And it's always the first time. For us, it's always the first time. We're called again and again to follow the one who became flesh. So at the end of this season, when we turn from the long season of ordinary time into the season of Advent, perhaps on that second Sunday of Advent, when we hear John the Baptist quote the words of Isaiah, we will not only hear John the Baptist echoing the words of Isaiah, but we will see the particular body of Dr. King also echoing those words from Isaiah. And that we will somehow see a double exposed photograph of Isaiah and John the Baptist and Dr. King with his particular body. And we will know more fully 
what Isaiah meant and what John the Baptist meant when Dr. King said to us in 63 it is obvious that America has defaulted on the promissory note promised to bring justice to her citizens of color only after telling the truth about bodies left out of the promise only then did he sing Isaiah's song I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted every hill and mountain be made low the rough places shall be made plain and the crooked places shall be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all shall see it together come and have breakfast Jesus said come follow me and don't forget to bring your body